Paul is ready to make his statement, and he is doing that today as we begin to study in Acts chapter 26. It is a great time to look at this part of the Bible. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hibbert. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, a program taking you through the Bible in one year. We've been doing that for 31 years. It's very exciting, actually. Well, Corey is here with Ryan. What's going on, Corey? I'm going to be taking a look at the city of Caesarea Maritima, where some of these chapters of Acts that we're reading actually occurred in this place. Ryan? Well, today I'm looking at the life of the former Pharisee and persecutor of Christians, Paul the Apostle. All right, very good. He was a former Pharisee. That's fascinating. Janice, what did you do? Fun Friday wrap-up. It's a question anywhere from... Acts chapter 9 through to 26. It's a lot of chapters right there. I tell you what, we this is a closed book test for them, <laughs> but an open book test for everybody else, so you can be ready for it. All right, let's read the Bible and find out. Acts 26, verses 1 through 15. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise our twelve tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Acts chapter 26, verses 1 through 15. Acts chapter 24, 25, and 26. That's our reading assignment today as we go through the Bible in one year. And it is very exciting. I'm telling you, the book of Acts is something else. Now, Paul was pleased for the chance to share his testimony before King Agrippa and the Roman authorities. Oh, this is good. Now, a testimony is evidence in support of a fact or a statement. Now, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to tell others, our friends and our family, our testimony, the reason we live like we do, the reason we change our habits and we've changed our attitudes, the evidence we give for how our life has changed and how it is different from others without Christ is powerful. 
We are followers of Jesus Christ, not followers of this world and its ways. In fact, our commitment to follow Christ even changes the way we process things that happen to us on a daily basis. Our best life will not be lived now, but will be lived in the future with God. We know that what we do now affects our future, but our focus really is not on trying to create physical prosperity here so much on the earth. Paul was willing to explain himself in this way to the Roman king and all who were in attendance. Acts chapter 26 brings everything back to why Paul was teaching and living the way he was. Now, this gets interesting. Get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. Now, if you don't have a Bible guide, just write to us. We'll send it to you. But this is absolutely amazing as we talk about the testimony. We are dealing with chapter 26, the first 15 verses. And I want to tell you something. It is great. Uh, you can get uh, your Bible guide at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Go there and it'll take you to a page. Donate. Thank you for your donations. I very much. We all very much appreciate them and they're very important right now. Thank you so much for that. Anyway, remember that the testimony is in the New Testament. That is the facts supporting Christianity. Resurrection is a huge part of it. And Paul's going to speak this. And Father, I pray today, as we look at this, that you would help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to understand everything you have said. And, you know, we're not looking to read into it what we want, but we're looking to listen to what the Bible tells us how our hearts should be, Father. And so in Jesus' wonderful name, and we all said together, Amen. Make it so, Lord Jesus. That's what amen means. Now, look at the first testimony or the first statement in Acts chapter 26. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you, sir, are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all things which I am accused of by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. I beg you to hear me patiently. Now, Paul exercises his oratory abilities to offer his testimony. Now, I want you to pay attention because we too are given opportunities to present our testimony. In fact, we should pray for that. I know a lot of people who say to me, well, I don't have opportunity uh, to share my testimony. You do. There's, there's several ways to share your testimony. One is to speak it and another is to live it. Live what you believe. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and God has instructed us how to live, we must live what we believe, and we ask the Holy Spirit to help us do that. That becomes very important. Let's go back to the scripture and read more. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know, they knew me from the first if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Pharisee means separated ones. I lived a Pharisee. Now, what does that mean? Paul's saying that he was separated for the word of God when he was young, a Pharisee. Now, beloved, we must separate ourselves to follow Jesus Christ. And see, when we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, it becomes important that we have to know what he did. That's why we read the Bible but we separate ourselves. We're not following the ways of this world. We're not following the trends of the culture of sin, but we're following Jesus Christ. Now that gets very interesting. Let me go on to the next scripture, Acts chapter 26, 6 to 15. And now he says, I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hoped to attain. 
For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, myself thought, I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and begin or being exceedingly enraged against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied, I journeyed to Damascus with authority and a commission from the chief priest. At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me saying in the Hebrew language, very important. Remember that Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Wow, what an amazing story. Jesus Christ takes the persecution of his people personally. That's why I pray for the persecuted church. Jesus Christ takes the persecution of his people personally. When we fall into persecution, we should praise God. Jesus Christ did as well fall into persecution. He says many times, blessed are you and men revile against you and say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Beloved, persecution is not something we look for. It's not something we encourage. But if it happens, God will sustain us. The Holy Spirit will help us. In the name of Jesus Christ, this is what we pray. Lord, help us today. And we said together, make it so, or amen. Hi, Rod Hembry. We go through the Bible in one year. It's exciting. It's great. And you can join us by searching Bible Discovery TV on your phone. That's right, on your phone, your iPhone, or your Android phone. And when you do so, you'll find the app. You can download the app and watch it anytime you want. Never miss a program right here on Bible Discovery TV. We'll see you there. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study, and today's reading is Acts 24 to 26. And in this portion of scripture, we read all about the Apostle Paul. So I thought it would do us well to trace the history of this man's incredible journey. Of course, before he met Jesus Christ, he was a Pharisee who was called Saul of Tarsus and was on a mission to slaughter all those of the way, Christians. That is, until he met the risen Lord for himself on the road to Damascus. Check it out. Paul the Apostle, though Jewish both by race and religion, was a citizen-born resident of the Greco-Roman city of Tarsus, which was by Paul's own description no insignificant city. Indeed, Tarsus was the capital of Cilicia and was a major city in Paul's time, probably boasting a population of half a million. Significantly, it was a university city, which ultimately surpassed even Athens and Alexandria. It had a level of political independence, and as a port city, it was a major center of trade. Indeed, Tarsus was best known for its Sicilium, a cloth woven from the hair of black goats, used in the making of the famous black tents of Tarsus. It is no surprise, therefore, that Paul's trade as a resident of this city was a tent maker. Tarsus was undoubtedly a part of the Greco-Roman world in which Rome governed, but where Greek culture pervaded. Even the Romans were Hellenized as they were greatly influenced by Greek art, philosophy, dress, athletics, and religion. Interestingly, Paul was both a citizen of Tarsus and Rome, two distinct and very privileged positions, suggesting that he was from a wealthy and influential family. Yet Paul primarily regarded himself as a Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, the strictest of all the sects of Judaism. 
Thus Paul, theologically, would not allow himself to be Hellenized. Still, writes Robert E. Piccarelli, although not Hellenizing in religion, even as a Jew, Paul's background was in a Hellenistic world. As a Greek-speaking native citizen of busy Tarsus and mighty Rome, his outlook could not help being affected. There is clear evidence of that effect in the picture of Paul we get in Acts and in his writings. He knew and quoted Greek poets, he obviously enjoyed the Greco-Roman athletic games, and used them often as illustrations in his letters. As a committed Jew, young Paul left Tarsus for Jerusalem to become a rabbi. He studied under Gamaliel, and according to Paul's own account, he excelled in Judaism beyond many of his contemporaries. Indeed, he became a respected rabbi and might have even been a member of the Sanhedrin. Paul would eventually even come to be the driving force behind the very first persecution of the church. However, while on his way to Damascus, the one whom he was persecuting dramatically confronted him, asking Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It was this encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ that began to turn this murderer into a missionary. He had come to persecute Jesus' name, but he would leave to bear it. Indeed, though unbeknownst to Paul, he, with his Greco-Roman background and his training in the scriptures, was God's chosen missionary to the Gentiles. In fact, almost half of the New Testament canon is attributed to Paul, and he was so influential that besides Jesus, he is the one credited with the establishment of Christianity. You know, Paul's encounter with Jesus and his conversion is truly amazing. But what's even more exciting to me is that this sort of stuff is still going on today. While people may not have had as, as a dramatic encounter as Paul did, I have heard about several testimonies of people having visions of Jesus Christ and have a sudden and dramatic change. A similar event actually happened to me when I was about 15 and to my great grandfather as well. And just like Paul, former skeptics turn into preachers of righteousness because they have seen the truth. Of course, as I said before, Jesus doesn't speak to everyone as dramatically as he did to Paul, but the point is that people are dramatically changed for the better when they come to Jesus Christ. That's because Jesus truly is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to God except through him. So make him your Lord today if you haven't already, because time is running out. You won't regret it. And you can do that right now by praying and saying, Lord Jesus, I believe you're God. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. I know that you died on the cross. We killed you, but you rose again on the third day. In Jesus' name, be the Lord of my life. Amen. Simple prayer. And if you mean it, God will reach out to you and you will be changed. Corey? All right. Well, these last few chapters of Acts occur while Paul is imprisoned at the city of Caesarea Maritima. Now, this city was a huge influential city during the lifetime of Christ and the lifetime of the early church and the apostles. So today, you and I are going to be exploring some of its history and some of its really interesting archaeology. Take a look. Caesarea Maritima was a grand port city on the Mediterranean Sea built by Herod the Great. It was built on an unhospitable stretch of seashore over top of a small rundown village, and on a scale so large and costly, it took around 12 years to build. Herod's first feat was to construct a massive harbor in an area of sea that was notoriously difficult for sailors, having no natural shelter from storms. Herod did this by constructing two huge stone breakwaters that enclosed a three and a half acre area of sea. The breakwaters extended a third of a mile out into the ocean and were about 200 feet wide so that ships could dock and unload passengers and cargo. And the shorter breakwater even boasted towers. At the sea entrance to the harbor, it's recorded that Herod erected six colossal statues, three on either side. The city itself is named after the first proper emperor of Rome and the man Herod had worked political deals with, Caesar Augustus. And a city named after the emperor and built by Herod the Great had to be illustrious. History records that Herod built the city not with local materials, but with expensive, impressive white stone. Fitting to its name, Herod constructed a large temple to Augustus on a hill of the city and a massive statue of the emperor to live inside it. 
He built Caesarea's famous theater that has been excavated and is still used today, a hippodrome for sporting events, and numerous public buildings to support a grand lifestyle for Caesarea's population. To facilitate this population, a sea-flushed sewer system was constructed, along with massive aqueducts that carried fresh water to the city. This aqueduct was partially underground and famously partially above ground. Its beautiful arches are still a major tourist attraction. Though, as it stands now, the aqueduct was expanded to carry a secondary channel of water by Emperor Hadrian in the 2nd century AD. Not to be outdone by the beauty of his city, Herod also constructed a shoreside palace for himself. Archaeologists have mused about how Herod seems to have enjoyed overcoming nature's barriers to human construction, and this palace is a good example. Built on an outcropping of rock extending into the sea, Herod's palace had a large freshwater pool at its center, fed by man-made underground channels. The pool would have had a large statue at its center, who it would have been of is up for debate. The pool was surrounded by walls of pillars to see out into the Mediterranean, and with large flower baskets, it would have made it seem like an oasis. Guests could come and go directly from their boats, and the palace was no doubt decorated to inspire awe at the grandeur of Herod. After Herod's death and the creation of Judea as a Roman province, the procurator or governor of Judea lived here at Herod's Caesarea Palace. What an interesting city. I mean, the history of Caesarea Maritima goes from its founding, you know, just before the death of Herod the Great, uh, all the way through early Christian history and, uh, you know, into, in some essence, that history stops, but then it picks back up in the Crusader period. And there's even interesting modern history about the finding and, and the excavating of Caesarea Maritima. So I wanted to highlight that today while in our reading, the Apostle Paul is staying there. So there was a great early Christian presence in Caesarea Maritima after uh, Paul and even before Paul with, of course, Philip coming there uh, that's also mentioned in Acts. You know, what's interesting to me is when you begin to study the cities um, and the empire, mm -hmm. uh, the Roman Empire, it was very sophisticated. I mm -hmm. mean, this thing was an impressive. I mean, the Greeks had really done a good job at, at uh, putting cities together, you know, and the Philippi and all the rest of it. And then the Romans just come in and they just they just totally take it over and just conquer. Yeah. And it, 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 it's, it, these cities are amazing. Yeah. And I mean, uh, you, when you look at Herod the Great, who was able to monopolize on that political situation uh, with with Rome and he was able to get himself into a position of power. I mean, love him or hate him. He was a bit crazy, but his his impact on the actual physical landscape and geography of the land of Jesus was immense. And it's undeniable, really, when you look back and you see all of these different cities and structures and aqueducts that he was able to build. So in many ways, he fulfilled his life goal of never being forgotten. And really, the Roman Empire was uh, ruling at the time that Jesus Christ came mm -hmm. in. So the Bible is written in the presence of the Roman Empire. And you have all of these politicians, you know, Pilate and all these people. And uh, <clears throat> they become famous because of that. And Jesus Christ came in the center of time, as we projected. So in other words, uh, he comes at the perfect time because he has no education. He has no media mm -hmm. training. He has no economic you know, forwardness. And he just becomes the reality of who God calls us to be because he is God. Mm -hmm. And this makes it absolutely famous. That's fascinating. Corey... You do something on the weekend. Tell us about it, your weekend round. I do. Okay, so I do a chapter by chapter recap of our assigned reading from the Discovery Guide and from the show, Bible Discovery TV. So it's the purpose is to get you caught back up if you've fallen behind on your reading or if you just want to quiz yourself to see if you remember what it is that you read this week because I know there's a lot jam-packed in there. So if that interests you, I upload every Saturday morning on my YouTube channel. So you can go to YouTube and just search my name, Corey Babechko. Corey Babechko on YouTube, very mm -hmm. important. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you want to join us as well, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we're on YouTube as well. We're on Facebook and, of course, 
Bible discovery. Now, there, we're doing something November 26th. Corey, what is it? We are. Okay, we are doing a live event. So you can find us, you know, live on YouTube, live on our uh, Facebook page, or live on our website. It is going to be called Prayer, Worship, and Warfare. So it's going to be a night where we're talking about all of those good things, the spiritual elements of prayer, what the Bible says about prayer. It's from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Friday, November uh 26th, 26. and that's Eastern Standard Time. So join us if you're able. Now we'll talk more about this on the next day program, Monday's program and all the rest of it because it's going to be an exciting broadcast. Mm -hmm. But we have to get to this question. Exactly. <laughs> all right. I have chosen Acts chapter 9. So if you have your Bible, you can always open it up to get the right answer. Who baptized Saul? Was that Ananias, Philip, or Barnabas? Who right, baptized Saul? Saul. That question is the central question of our being now. Who baptized Saul? And for Don't those of you, close your Bible. No, for it, those, we got it. We got for it those already. Of you that are just reading the Bible for the first time, Saul is converted to Paul. So this is who I'm referring to right now. Who baptized Saul? Who later became Paul? Was that Ananias, Philip, or Barnabas? What do you think? God had to talk to him as well because yeah. he was want to go. He didn't want to go to Saul. Anyway, go ahead. It, it just for a split second when you said it, it gave us just a little bit of pause. But it's Ananias. <laughs> yeah. And is that what you said at home? If you did, if you chose Ananias, you are absolutely right. Acts chapter nine verse eighteen says immediately there fell from his eyes, talking about Saul, something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. All right. So that, I look forward to that. It's a great question. And on Monday, we're going to study more through the weekend. Join Corey at CoreyBebechko.com or Corey Bebechko on YouTube. You know, I want to encourage you and thank you for joining us today. And I want to remind you of our prayer meeting at Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 3.30 to 4.30 live on Facebook and YouTube. That's New York time, 3.30 to 4.30. We're going to pray for you and join us as we do that. Today we pray, Lord, I pray the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for it. I pray that you would help it and that you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, would grow it the people would listen to you. Amen.